Welcome. Our guest today is a seasoned journalist, an experienced information manager, a resilient businessman, a member of the prestigious Nigerian Institute of Public Relations, and a philanthropist who currently serves as the Commissioner for Information in Delta State, a position he assumed after holding the fort as the Chief Press Secretary to the Delta State Governor for four years. Mr. Charles Anyago joins us for a one-on-one -on -one conversation to share his experience about surviving COVID-19 and his work as an image maker, especially in these unprecedented times. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you very much, Felicity. Tell us about the moment when you confirmed that you are COVID-19 positive. Well, let me first give glory to God that um, I have survived the virus. But at the time I set out to take the test, it was not based on anybody's prompting. I had thought that as somebody who is in the front line of sensitization of uh, deltans on account of the dangers of uh, COVID-19 and the necessary protocol that they need to observe, but it was incumbent on me to also lead by example, which was to take the test and let those who may have become so scared of the virus to understand that it's something that is not a death sentence, that you can show up for test, and then if, even if it turns out positive or negative, you can sub, uh, submit yourself for treatment and then observe the necessary protocols. And that even if it turns out negative, you're also able to let individuals understand. But it just turned out at the end of the day, that mind turned out positive. And uh, when that happened, I made myself available for the uh, medical personnel to give their necessary advice. And the first uh, examined if I can afford to isolate at home since mine was a little on the mild side. And having examined my house, they said, OK, yes, I told them I can afford to uh, isolate at home and observe all those protocols of not allowing individuals to visit me and uh, have to continue to move in the public space. And that was what happened, and my drugs was made available to me while they continued to call and sometimes also to come and check if uh, my temperature or any other thing was in good uh, shape. And I give God the glory that after about uh, 17 days in isolation, I went, but before then, I went back at the 16th day to have a retest. And at the end of the day, by the grace of God, it turned out negative. And so I had to return back to work. Um. Congratulations on that, really. Uh, it's not a death sentence, as we all know, but the one experience that uh, people don't seem to talk a lot about is surviving isolation. The word itself inspires a little bit of fear. How did you uh, manage through that period? Well, for me, apart from those who self-isolate at home, I would have preferred that they continue to call it treatment center rather than isolation center. Of course, you know at the beginning, because coronavirus is novel, the moment you are suspected to have the virus, you are taken out of the society pending when your result um, uh, is out and then before treatment begins. But these days, the moment you even uh, show up for testing, uh, you are encouraged, uh, the, if you have the symptoms, to even immediately begin uh, treatment. That was what happened in my own case, because just less than 24 hours after I subjected myself to test, I discovered that I have lost my sense of smell. And at that moment, I called the doctor, one uh, doctor, uh, Mrs. Peace uh, Iosewe, very, very wonderful, is the CMD of um, Asaba Specialist Hospital. She was there through and through, and every call she answers, and sometimes she also called to check up how I was doing. And so uh, I had to observe those protocols. But isolation is a sickness in its own, <laughs> particularly for those of us who are always... Um, uh, up and doing in the public space for you to just stay alone in the morning in the afternoon mine could even be said to be better because at least i have a fairly uh, large compound where i'm staying alone that you can always come down or move around within the compound at least you are not interacting with uh, any other person but for those who may not have such facility is is quite difficult and then when you are taken to a government facility of course your area of interaction is um, further contracted so when that happens, you just need to begin to think of surviving and not the comfort of uh, your home. Because at the, at the moment you survive, you return to uh, winning ways and join other persons. 
After all, there are those who are sentenced to prison for a number of years and they still cope. So right. the moment you are surviving and the, uh, the sickness is not, you are not overwhelmed by the challenges of the sickness, you just have to give glory to God. But I All think right. that as time goes on, the government, we need to begin to take a second look at what constitutes the treatment center, otherwise known as isolation center. We'll, we'll, what we'll are the facilities that put no. in place so that yeah, individuals, individuals are not uh, feeling bad, that they are just uh, keep kept in one place. All right. Um, having experienced all of this, um, what worries you about the seeming skepticism that is still being expressed about the existence of COVID-19? We do know that there is a professor who has come out to boldly challenge the government to prove the existence of COVID-19. There are two major factors that I think has contributed to the cynicism and prejudice that exists now in our own part of the world. One is that over the years, because of failure of subsequent, uh, subsequent governments, our people have little or no faith in what government says. Because over the years, government will promise you they are going to do this, and then you discover that it's not done. So whenever government says it's going to do something or that this is what it is, the tendency for individuals and members of the uh, society to doubt is quite high. Then the second is the fact that we are very religious uh, people. And the moment our religious leaders uh, give us a contrary view, the tendency to believe the religious leaders more than those in authority is also quite high. And unfortunately, in this part of the world, either because of pecuniarism or some form of bigotry at the religious level, you have our religious leaders having to tell the public that no, there's nothing like coronavirus, that they should come to church, they should pray, that God will take it away. Forgetting that before now, there have been a lot of other infirmities. Whether it's in form of polio, be polio became something small because the vaccine will have been before now been um, uh, been discovered, and as such, you are you are giving vaccine against polio. There are a number of other sicknesses that you take vaccine that were in existence before some of these uh, religious persons came on board. Okay. The same thing it is with COVID nineteen. Twenty years time, those that are born may not understand what we have gone through, and they will come to realize that possibly there is a vaccine, and they will say, "Okay, go and take vaccine against COVID nineteen." But those who are now seeing coronavirus being the first kind of infirmity that is coming in our own time, and they're making individuals believe that there's nothing like that, that is not being fair. Our religious leaders need to understand that COVID-19 is no respecter of any religion, neither is it respecter of any tribe. They need to assist us as government personnel to sensitize members of the public. Right. If there's any professor that says there's nothing like coronavirus, I pray that he does not contract the virus so that he does not become um, like the Dalton Thomas who may have to experience this before he believes. For me, the uh, 19 is real, and I know what I experienced, I know what other persons experienced, and that it cannot be anything compared to malaria because even the drugs you are administered, it's not the same drug that you are administered when you have malaria. All right. Um, what are you doing now that you are back uh, on the saddle to help address this skepticism a little bit more holistically, a little different maybe from what you were doing before um, you contracted the virus? Well, now those who speak English say the experience uh, uh, is better than um, just any other thing that you are thinking. And at this moment, I'm equipped with the experience of having gone through it. And then also, I've also avoided the state government some of the uh, knowledge I got in the course of it, particularly as to how we are managing the uh, the pandemic, i.e. issues of contact tracing, and then how to also deal with those who may have uh, unfortunately contracted the virus. I've also been able to understand that a certain um, uh, regime in terms of uh, administration of the drugs. And of course, we have to also change uh, uh, the mood of sensitizing members of the public to get them understand that yes, these are some of the symptoms that may look like my, that may look like malaria, but that they are not the same. Because in this part of the world, we are used to malaria, and within a, a two, three, or four days, you are out of fit. Except maybe you are taking a drug that is not um, uh, 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 efficacious enough, and then you now have to maybe try another drug. But a situation where you are taking one. And nobody will tell you, in the case of malaria, that you must take all the necessary multivitamins and all that to boost your immune system. You do know that we are very much used to self-medication. Once you have malaria in this part of the world, more than 80% of those who come down with malaria don't even go for any test. Their system, they know that they have malaria because we are used to it. You just go to the right. next shop, which is why 
malaria drugs in this part of the world is just ac uh, across the counter. It's not like if in the U.S. anything I have to, if you even report that you have malaria in a place like the United States, you are quarantined. But here, it is just normal. They will just ask you, okay, just go and buy this and buy that, and then you just take it, and then you move on as if nothing has happened. But that is not the same thing with COVID-19. All right. Malaria only kills when the individual that comes out with malaria does not have the money to treat it. But coronavirus, whether you have money or not, if it has gotten to the level where it takes charge of your organs, your money will not save you. A very case, a good case in point is a uh, late uh, uh, chief of staff to the president of blessed memory, Abba Kiari. He has all the money, but when coronavirus came calling, he took advantage of his pre-existing conditions, and unfortunately, we lost that very intelligent officer. What are you doing uh, differently now to address this skepticism that people are expressing? I am relating my experience. I cannot tell them that it is, if I say it is real, it is not based on the fact that I heard it from somewhere, because I'm not a doctor. But I have become now a doctor in it because I've experienced it. So experience is not teaching me more to understand that this is real. So because I have experienced it, I have gone through it, and I knew the kind of symptoms I had, and I knew the treatment regime that I went through. So in sensitizing the people, I can speak much more authoritatively. I'm not only saying what happened to Mr. A. I am saying what happened to me. Among the many concerns brought on by this pandemic is that of job loss. I want you to talk to us about the state government. What, how is the state government working to minimize the economic impact on citizens of the state? Well, I must admit that the economic impact of uh, the pandemic is, is uh, unimaginable. And then, unfortunately, you know, when it started, almost everybody was um, uh, thrown overboard, so to say. Everybody was challenged because it's novel. And then the fact is that we were much more concerned on how do we make people to survive. So every train was more like placed on, on halt. But along the line, we discovered that it's a pandemic that we have to live with for a little while. And as a state government in Delta, we now came back to now examine how do we continue to cope with the virus. And that now led us to taking the decision to ensure that all the other existing programs that we have, i.e. construction of roads, building of more classrooms, building of more infrastructure in a number of areas, creating of more jobs, which has been the hallmark of the COA-led administration, we have to continue. Because we realize that not doing that means that you're also creating another pandemic which is the hunger pandemic that will come on account of the idleness of a number of our people. Here in Delta State, we have a lot of able-bodied young men and women. And to that extent, to be able to cope with the challenges thrown up by COVID-19, we realize that allowing the contractors to return to work, we mean that a number of uh, skilled and unskilled labor hands will be engaged. Continuing the building of uh, classrooms and blocks will also mean that a number of skilled and unskilled hands will also remain engaged. The same thing we also did with our job creation strategies, that we don't just need to just stay put with COVID-19, everyday COVID-19, and as if that is the only thing that we have to do. But unfortunately, because COVID-19 has also affected the monoproduct that we have in this part of the world, which is oil, because a number of the machines are no longer rolling in the advanced countries that were before now and still remain a major import, a major buyers of the oil, which is our monoproduct. And of course, when that happens, Delta State being the number one oil producing state is directly, not even indirectly, also affected. And that has reduced the, the, the capital receipts that comes into our state. And because we realize that is the case, we're also discussing with our um, workforce to meet us halfway, that as we make progress, yes, up to this moment, we are paying the new minimum wage, but we hope that if it continues the way it is, we will approach our labor force for the purpose of them getting to understand that we need to restructure our government in such a way that uh, everything uh, still remains viable, right. i.e. Right. Uh, keeping fit with the um, level of work and then also sustaining the workforce. Okay, just hold on to your thoughts. For now, let's go on a quick break. More conversation when we return. Thank you for staying with us. We still have with us the Honorable Commissioner for Information uh, for Delta State. Uh, thank you very much for staying with us, sir. Thank you. The pleasure still remains my Before we went on that break, uh, you were talking about some of the strategies you are employing to ensure the pandemic doesn't negatively affect the people too much. Now, 
At the beginning of this pandemic, you called on wealthy Nigerians and religious groups to give back to the people. What has been, what has the response been since then for those uh, in Delta State? Well, let me tell you that the response has been quite amazing and we appreciate all those who have contributed and of course who heeded to our call. Uh, right from uh, the beginning, we saw a lot of uh, well-meaning individuals, both within and outside the state, uh, having to uh, make contribution, particularly to alleviate the sufferings of the people on account of uh, uh, COVID-19 that made it impossible for them to continue their uh, daily businesses. A number of them provided um, uh, gift items, uh, food items. There are those also who provided cash. There are also a number of others who also brought in uh, medical um, equipment. And these medical supplies have also assisted in us in so many ways as a state. Both corporate bodies and individuals. We must appreciate uh, the CACOVID, a group uh, led by the central bank. They have brought in a lot of uh, food items. And any moment from now, we will start uh, the distribution of uh, another uh, tract of food items to our people and the different communities. We have done that before. But beyond individuals having to contribute to the state government and then um, contribute to our food bank, they were those who also directly uh, decided to uh, distribute uh, these food items at the different communities. They provided uh, these things at different communities, both politicians, some persons who have some businesses, and because we pleaded with them that your widow's mind is welcome. And so uh, people pleaded, and to a very large extent, it helped to mitigate the challenges thrown up by the COVID. Otherwise, the level of insecurity would have skyrocketed because a hungry man, they say, is an angry man. By the time people become so hungry, the tendency that they take to acts that they are not used to is quite high. As it has as a criminally minded um, activities where individuals may have to uh, resort to taking what does not belong to them because of hunger. But these interventions by these different persons uh, filled in the gap beyond what government was able to muster we are quite pleased with uh, the level of uh, cooperation and assistance that we got from uh, a number of Nigerians. And we say right. may God bless them for that uh, contri uh, contribution. All right, please talk to us about the government's decision to introduce property tax in urban areas of the state. Uh, some would wonder, why now? Well, let me tell you that we are not introducing it. I also made that clarification in the course of my interaction with uh, uh, newsmen that on account of our seventh... Um, uh, ESCO meeting, we did agree that there is a need to strengthen um, uh, revenue structure. And then one of such areas where we can take advantage of to show up our revenue base so that we can meet up with other obligations is to uh, conduct some form of enumeration of uh, properties of individuals, particularly those in the urban centers. Because over the years, a number of persons have built in these urban centers and they became urban centers because government have been able to provide a number of facilities. And so, if we decide that we are not going to carry out such enumeration, we will end up leaving out a number of persons that ordinarily should be part of our tax net. And when we bring them into the tax net, it means that we're able to show up our revenue. As I speak to you, on account of the challenges of COVID-19, our monthly uh, internally generated revenue has dropped to as low as uh, 4 billion, as against over 6 billion that we, you should expect, and then building it up more to 7 or 8 billion. The more money we have, the more projects we are going to be able to execute, the more sustainable you, are, you can uh, uh, assure or ensure that the work of the civil service will remain. If we decide to leave those who can afford to pay, the houses in urban centers are much more expensive, not because they are more beautiful. They are more expensive because there are facilities such as roads, pipe of water, and a number of other things that the government have done. And also, if you don't put them into the tax net so that they can also contribute and meet government halfway, you would have ended up providing uh, facilities free and then not able to even expand your uh, your urban centers. Okay. We have, in the last four years, been able to expand our urban centers on account of the facilities, particularly in the area of roads and then uh, pipe and water that we are providing as a government. The more we provide this, the more the challenge of also coping for, with, uh, for uh, providing life and making it uh, much more livable for people in other uh, remote communities that are semi-urban or those in the rural areas. And so it is incumbent on us to get these other persons who, by the grace of God, are benefiting on account of government intervention to also bring back to the society so that by so doing, we can also provide for other persons. How do you explain that somebody is able to collect so much money in terms of rent on account of the accessibility of his house, and yet he does not even give back a penny to government? Okay. And every other time, 
those in the rural communities are suffering because those in the city just want to enjoy everything. We believe that as a government, and for us to also meet up with what standard, that we need to do that. The World Bank is also interested in giving us a, a more than $2 million dollar grant. Okay. And we believe that they just have also given us uh, a criteria that if we are not able to also clean up our ability to also rake in more money at our own level where we can uh, show some form of transparency and our ability to generate more funds, that money will not be available for us to run. Still talking about the state executive council uh, decisions, on June 16, you announced that the ESCO had approved the setting up of a modular refinery and commencement of work at an agro-industrial park in the state. Where are you on this? Well, the issue of modular refinery, what we did say is that there is a private sector player who are only just buying in into that particular uh, uh, venture so that we now collaborate with the private sector player, invest in it so that as they are, because we have um, abundant uh, gas and um, uh, uh, crude reserve in our, in our state, and that we cannot continue to just leave it for other person to just come and take away, that as a government, we can buy, have a buy-in into this uh, investment of this private sector player. And then when that happens, it means that we are investing uh, for, uh, for the future uh, for our children, into the future for our children. That is ongoing. Uh, as a state government, we have already approved our participation and the need for us to put in our own uh, equity contribution to the setting up of that uh, modular refinery. On the issue of the agro-industrial park in a place called Abogwashi, in a near South local government area of the state, we are riding on with that just uh, uh, in our immediate past uh, ESCO, we also deliberated upon it. We have two other uh, players, we say PPP arrangement, where we have um, a public-private partnership with two other um, private sector players who have decided to bring in 40% equity in that particular venture, while these other two are bringing in 30-30% um, of uh, the equity. And to make that, to kick off that, to kick start that, we are taking advantage of the central bank um, commercial credit commercial agricultural credit scheme, where you can obtain as, as much money as you desire at a single interest rate. And to this extent, we are applying for 10 billion naira from the Central Bank of Nigeria, and we are trying as much as possible to clean up the processes. Yep. The state government at the school has approved that particular uh, loan to come from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, could you talk to us as quickly and as briefly as you can what is being done during this raining per period? Because we know that NIMED has predicted flooding and lots of rain for Delta State. How are you making sure that the negative impact of these floods does not affect the people too much? I can report to you authoritatively that about 18 local governments have been predicted to be impacted in our state. And that largely the flood for 2020 is going to be river flood. And it's not like a, a splash rain, a splash uh, rainfall that may come on account of uh, such a splash flood that will arise uh, due to torrential uh, rainfall. But largely because of the increase in the volume of water in the river, and this time around the River Niger, you know, of course, what makes up data is because of the several estuaries of the River Niger that empties into the Atlantic Ocean. We are already in the process of commencing sensitization of our people, particularly those who live in flood-prone areas. We are convinced that uh, our approach in the past cannot be sustainable this time around on account of the challenge of the COVID. Before now, we ask them to move, we establish um, uh, camps where we quarter them and feed them for a period of two months plus before we ask them to go back to their different communities. But it's very much obvious that that may not be feasible this time around because we are not going to be able to quarter everybody in a camp now due to the issue of a prevalence of a transmission of a, a COVID-19, particularly at community level. And so we are looking at other means of uh, letting them know that they need to move to a higher ground, good enough in this part of the world, communal spirit, perfect the atmosphere. We do believe that our brothers and sisters will be their brother's keeper, while as a government, we begin to also explore other means of uh, meeting our people halfway. Our desire is that at the end of the day, we don't lose anybody on account of the surgeon flood. We certainly hope <laughs> that does not happen. Um, just to wrap things up now, uh, we've been talking so seriously about the work uh, that the state government is doing uh, to help mitigate the challenges of COVID-19 on the people. I want to ask you this very personal question. What aspects of your work has been the most challenging during this pandemic and how are you surmounting it? 
Well, let me first tell you that the, uh, the advantage I have as a commissioner in, uh, for information in data is the fact that I have a governor who matches words with action. And so I don't have any reason to begin to fashion out what lie to tell members of the public. In the case of communicating to our people during this period, the major challenge has been that of cynicism amongst members of the public. Good enough here in Delta, there's a, a higher measure of trust between the people and the government, unlike what we obtain in other places. And that is largely due to the fact that with the governor makes promises, he lives up to it. The ones that he cannot do, he will tell you, please give us time. This one, we cannot do it. It's not a question of just making political promises that you know is not backed up by any um, implementation plan. The major challenge that came is what I told you earlier, some form of religious bigotry, where some religious leaders will let individuals believe that nothing like COVID-19. And so when you now go out in the public, they mix it because of our religious inclination to say, no, don't worry, God will save us. Yes. God will save us. But it's very, very clear in Matthew chapter 4, verse 7, when Jesus Christ responded to devil, the devil's inquiry in Matthew chapter 4, verse 6, he told Jesus to jump down from the mountain and that God will keep the angels guard over him. Jesus Christ responded, said, Thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to test. In which case, it's not because Jesus is not aware that God will protect him, but he knows that God is not a magician and that it's not, it's not good for you to put the Lord thy God to test. COVID-19 is already known to us to be a moving train. To jump in front of the moving train because you have a God that will save you will amount to putting the Lord thy God to test. You never get away from trying to um, educate the people even in your closing remarks. Thank you very much for joining us for this conversation. Thanks for having me, Felicity, and keep doing the good work that you are known for. Thank you. And that's our conversation on One on One today. I hope you got the information, the reiteration of the fact that COVID-19 is real. People have experienced it and they are better now. It's not a death sentence, neither is it a joke. So we must take the necessary actions to stay safe and protect others as well. More conversations like this here on PLOS TV Africa. Thank you once again for your time. My name is Felicity Ezewike. Thank <laughs> you.